the fourth session of the 2015 Mini Medical School series. Uh, it's thrilling to see you all the, hanging through each session. It's great to see you here tonight. I'm Susan Reed. I'm professor of obstetrics and gynecology and adjunct professor in epidemiology, division chief of gynecology at Harborview. And it's my pleasure to welcome you along with my co-moderator, Dr. Mika Sinanan, who is professor of general surgery here at the University of Washington and our uh, practice plan president. This evening, uh, we have a great topic that as I uh, thought about it, we'll be ta talking about tackling twin epidemics, new innovations to fight obesity and diabetes. And as an obstetrician, this topic is very important to me. I know now, and when I trained, we didn't have this understanding that the in utero environment impacts the weight of the baby in utero such that it's not only the genetic component that the baby is receiving, but it's the environment and the epigenetics that can modify the weight of that baby. In addition, that baby is at risk for diabetes. So controlling weight for our pregnant mothers is essential. As a surgeon, I understand uh, the risks that obesity brings to my patients. So this is an important area for me. And then lastly, as an epidemiologist, we look across the globe at how people are tackling obesity. I have Japanese colleagues who, uh, does anybody know the obesity rate in Japan? It's like 3.5%, I think, and we're around 35%, but our experts are going to tell us more about that. What my Japanese colleagues told me was that they literally, their government gets out the waste tape, they check their wastes, and if you're above a certain amount, their companies can be uh, fined. And my colleagues told me that they couldn't get health insurance. I'm not sure that's true, but they have a lot of government control around this issue. So for every one of you aspiring uh, medical students in the audience, this is a very, very important topic. It's my pleasure to first introduce uh, Dr. Ur Earl Hirsch, and he is a diabetes treatment and teaching endowed chair and professor in metabolism, endocrine, and nutrition department at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's the medical director for the Diabetes Care Center, and his clinical interests are in new technologies for the treatment of diabetes particularly those involved in the use of insulin therapy and the management of hyperglycemia within the hospital. Dr. Uh, Hirsch is pictured here, uh, uh, looks like racquetball, is that right, Earl, in the middle? With uh, his uh, wife, he has research interests uh, that concentrate on the importance of glucose variability in the pathogenesis of diabetes complications. I know this because he works intricately with the uh, obstetrics department around diabetes in pregnancy. He's contributed to many uh, randomized controlled trials, just a few of these are listed uh, here. And he's uh, authored over 150 manuscripts, chapters, uh, uh, books. And I was impressed to see that he was editor-in-chief of Diabetes, Obesity, and Cardiovascular Disease News, which is sponsored by the American Diabetes Association. He earned his medical degree from the University of Missouri in Columbia and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Miami and Mount Sinai Hospital. He completed a research fellowship at the University of Washington in St. Louis, Missouri, the other University of Washington. And it's my great pleasure to introduce him to you tonight. Thank you very much. Good evening, many medical students. Um, let's see if, okay. So, I titled this uh, discussion, Diabetes in America, What Every Mini Medical Student Should Know. And my first question to you, many medical students, is which of these people have, or if they, they're deceased, had diabetes? Let's see 
what we can say here. Is this pointer working? Who's this? Did he have diabetes? He sure did. Who's this? Who's this? Halle Berry. Does she have diabetes? She does. And, and in fact, her diabetes, we understand, is quite interesting. She does not have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. We are told she has actually something called maternally, excuse me, maturity onset diabetes of adults, or MODI. Uh, what, who is this young lady right below her, right here? Does she have diabetes? Yeah. And who is, who is this guy right here? Ron Sano, grew up in Seattle. Did he have diabetes? Absolutely he did. And what about the lady next to, next to, did she have diabetes or does she? Yes. What about him? Who's that? Does he have diabetes? Of course, type 2. And what about the gentleman right below? Who's that? Jay Cutler, does he have diabetes? Yes, he does. He has type 1. Who knows who this is next to Jay Cutler? Miss America. What's her name? <laughs> her name is Nicole Johnson, 1999 Miss America. And she was the one that really was a huge boom for insulin pump therapy in adolescent girls, because she wears an insulin pump. Who's this guy right here next to Nicole Johnson? Gary Hall, fastest, uh, fastest swimmer in the world. Another one with diabetes. And who's this guy over here on the far, on the far left? Does he have diabetes? Type 2. What about the guy right here? <laughs> Mr. Interception. Oh, I should... Shh. Does he have diabetes? What is, what is his connection to diabetes? His father. His father died in his 50s from diabetes, and he talks about his dad all the time. And the point is, there are so many people with diabetes, and most of you, if you don't have diabetes, you are connected to, to diabetes. Raise your hand if you or a family member have diabetes. It's almost all of you. That's a lot, 90% of you. So what is diabetes? Let's start with the definition. It's not quite as simple as you might think. Diabetes mellitus, which is the formal name, it's a group of metabolic diseases. It's just not one disease characterized by hyperglycemia, which means high blood sugar, resulting from defects in insulin action. The insulin isn't working correctly. So that's one of the things that can cause diabetes. Insulin secretion, not enough insulin is made, or both. It is a chronic disorder characterized by abnormalities in the metabolism of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And over a period of time, it is often accompanied by microvascular, that small blood vessel, macrovascular, that's a big blood vessel, and neuropathic complications. And this is the exact same slide I show the other non-mini medical students because it, this is really important. It's a group of disorders and it's, and it's complex. So what is fueling the diabetes epidemic in the U.S.? And I think you all know from the theme of tonight, of course, the theme is obesity, and perhaps this one famous, famous author said it best, I found out there was only one way to look thin, and that is hang out with fat people. Um, and and, and it, it's not a joking matter, but there have obviously been a lot of jokes about this problem. If we look at the estimates of diagnosed diabetes among adults in the U.S., the statistics are staggering. If you look at 1994, with the darker areas being the higher amounts of diabetes, specifically 4.5 to 5.9%, back in 1994, and we fast forward to 2009, looking at diabetes. Yeah, that's my reaction, because this darkest orange color down here, that's greater than 10.6% of that population has diabetes. And you could come up here to Washington State and say, well, we're not doing so badly, and I would say, I think we are all doing poorly, why are we seeing so much diabetes? Because, as you will see in a few minutes from Dr. Schur, it's the obesity that is fueling this. And now if we look here county by county at Washington State, what you can see here is that in King County, we're at 6.9% of the population with diabetes. If we go south to Pierce, we're at 9.3% of the population. But out here, if we go towards the ocean to Grays Harbor, 
11.1% of the population with diabetes. 11.1, it's more than one in 10. And if we look at the most recent statistics by the Center of Disease Control in Atlanta, it's over 29 million people and we are approaching 10% of the population in the U.S. with diabetes. This is no laughing matter because this is responsible for a huge amount of, of suffering and mortality. And what's really scary to me about this is that 21 million people are diagnosed, but there are over 8 million people with undiagnosed diabetes, which means there are probably people in this room tonight who have diabetes and don't know it. And that, to me, is the most scary part of this story because this is certainly a treatable disease. We are focused on money, and rightly so, because this is an expensive disease. And if we look at the annual health care costs for patients without and then with diabetes, in 2013, the American Diabetes Association presented these data that it was $5,956 if you don't have diabetes, but your per year costs if you do have diabetes, where is this going to end? Over 13, almost $14,000 per year per patient. Now think of it for a moment. If this was you and you don't have diabetes and you had to put out this much money per year to take care of your diabetes, it's staggering. And if we look at all of the costs of diabetes in 2012, what you see is by far what costs the most is when you have to go into the hospital to take care of a problem related to your diabetes. The next most common costs are the medications, either for treating the complications or for treating the blood glucose itself. And actually, the physician's fees are a relatively small part of the pie compared to everything else. So I think the first question we have to ask is, how is diabetes diagnosed? Well, you're laughing. You're laughing. But back, you know, 2,500 2, years ago, this is how it was diagnosed. Not quite like this, but when um, someone urinated, the ants would come by because of all of the glucose in the urine. But the important point that, I, that needs to be understood about how do we draw the line for blood glucose, for where is diabetes diagnosed, it has to do when the eye doctor can see the changes in the back of the eye called diabetic retinopathy. The diagnosis of diabetes is where you see an easy complication to see diabetic retinopathy. And if you look at either FPG, which is fasting plasma glucose, the two-hour after-meal glucose, or hemoglobin A1C, and hemoglobin A1C, raise your hand if you've heard of hemoglobin A1C before. That's about half of you. Well, this is an important test. It's a test that measures the average amount of sugar on the red blood cell. Red blood cells, yes, their most important um, function is to take oxygen to the cells of the body. But as it turns out, the red blood cell, which lives about 90 days, can also bind to glucose. And so by measuring the amount of glucose or sugar on the red blood cell, we can tell what has the average blood sugar been for the last 90 days or three months. So it turns out it's a very important test that everyone with diabetes needs to have several times per year. And if we look at this graph for where we start seeing an increase in diabetic eye disease or diabetic retinopathy, it's over here where the fasting glucose is above 130, where the two hour after meal glucose is above 200, and the hemoglobin A1C level is above 6%. And so these numbers were not made arbitrarily. They were based on populations showing different data for where different populations got diabetic eye disease. So the official plasma glucose, now this is important. Plasma means it's drawn in a tube by the lab. You can't diagnose diabetes from a finger stick. But where we diagnose diabetes is when the plasma glucose is equal to or greater than 126. Now, that seems like an odd number. Where did they pick 126? It's because the rest of the world measures glucose in different units. We measure it in milligrams per deciliter. The rest of the world does it in millimoles per liter, and this is 7.0 millimolar. And that's where they get diabetes. An oral glucose tolerance test where uh, Dr. Reed does this quite frequently with women who are pregnant. In people who are not pregnant, we can use a 75-gram glucose tolerance test. 
and two hours after that, if the glucose is above 200, that is diagnostic of diabetes, or hemoglobin A1C equal to or greater than 6.5%. Now, if the patient is not symptomatic, you have to have two of these done. If the patient is symptomatic, that is not the case. Because if you have a random glucose above 200 and the patient is symptomatic, you have diabetes. Symptomatic means frequent urination, frequent thirst, and losing weight when you're not trying to lose weight. Those are all symptoms of diabetes. Now, I think what many of you will find even more interesting is this concept of prediabetes. People who are at high risk for developing diabetes, but they don't quite make the glucose numbers that we diagnose diabetes by. So if the fasting glucose is between 100 and 125 from a blood draw from the arm, that is one way to diagnose prediabetes. If doing a glucose tolerance test with the same 75 gram glucose load and the glucose is between 140 and 199, that is prediabetes. Or if the hemoglobin A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4%. Understanding this is a continuum. So if the hemoglobin A1C is 6.3, you have a higher risk than if the hemoglobin A1C is 5.8, but nevertheless, the risk is still there for developing diabetes in the future. So the question is, okay, you are diagnosed with prediabetes, you have risk factors, you're sedentary, you're overweight, and maybe you have a family history of diabetes. Is there anything we can do to prevent conversion from going from prediabetes to diabetes? And the good news is the answer is yes. We know that based on four separate trials from around the world, by lifestyle alone, diet and exercise, one can reduce the risk of developing diabetes by 29 to 59%. That's a lot. As it turns out, one could also use medications to reduce the risk of diabetes, going from 29% on the low side to up to 75% with using medications. The medication most commonly used is metformin. We, we, we will talk about metformin more in just a couple of minutes, but metformin by itself can reduce the risk of 20, by 25 to 35% and overall is more effective with younger and more obese individuals. But what's interesting when you look at the different controlled trials, looking to see can we reduce the risk of diabetes with medication or lifestyle, what you will find out is nobody has really studied the more important question in my mind, and that is what happens if you do both, medication and lifestyle. And that may be, I think, where our next big studies need, need to go, given what a huge public health problem this is. Now, there are two major forms of diabetes, and like Halle Berry, like we are told she has, maturity onset diabetes of youth, or MODI, um, there are many other types of diabetes, but we usually talk about two different forms. One is type 1 diabetes, where insulin is required for survival. It usually presents before the age of 30, but about 20% present as adults. And it's not only often misdiagnosed, it's usually misdiagnosed. And I average, we see one or two patients a week in our clinic who are misdiagnosed as having type 2 diabetes, despite the fact they're losing weight, their blood sugars are very high, and the pills they're taking are not working. And that, I think, is the biggest surprise with the medical students in our clinic, is how many patients we see with type 1 diabetes diagnosed as adults. The oldest patient we have that I have seen with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes came in at the age of 92. And it is very common for us to see parents of children who have type 1 diabetes and even grandparents coming in with newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. So it's not a disease of children like I was taught when I was a medical student. It's a disease um, that can present in the elderly. And the other really interesting part about this story and part of our research here at UW is taking care of this new population that is geriatric type 1 patients, patients who have had their, di their diabetes 40, 50, 60, even 70 years. And we see a lot of those patients here at UW. Traditionally, we think of type 1 diabetes as non-obese. We know there is a strong genetic predisposition, yet when you talk to patients and you find out, 90% of patients do not have a family history of any diabetes. So we know that type 1 diabetes is due to chronic autoimmunity, meaning 
the body is attacking the cells in the pancreas that is making the insulin. And this autoimmune response has been relatively well worked out over the past 30 years. This is maybe the most important picture of what type 1 diabetes really looks like. Over here, we look at normal insulin secretion, normal islet function, so this would be 100% up here. And this red line going across is how much insulin you need to lose, somewhere usually between 80 or 90% before the high blood sugar starts and the symptoms may start in type 1 diabetes. We know there's a genetic risk. We don't understand the environmental insult, but there is this autoimmune attack that we can measure by measuring antibodies in the blood. And what happens is over time, the amount of insulin made continues to go down, but the patient has no symptoms until they cross the line and then the symptoms occur and insulin needs to be started. We call this a preclinical period, but what we also know is that this autoimmune response may be more robust in some patients, especially in young children under the age of five, and the preclinical period is not as long. What I find the most interesting is this purple line up here, where there's a genetic risk, the environmental insult doesn't happen until much later, the autoimmune attack occurs, but the patient literally goes to their grave with preclinical type 1 diabetes, even though this autoimmune attack has done something to the pancreas. Now think about it for a moment. What if this patient here is obese with a family history of type 2 diabetes and then also develops type 2 diabetes independent of that? So they have this type 1 diabetes, but they also develop type 2 diabetes and there have been a lot of names given to that. Um, the name that most people use, even though it's not accepted by the American Diabetes Association, is type one and a half diabetes. But <laughs> this happens, and it happens a lot. Now, I mentioned that type one diabetes is generally associated with non-obesity. That is not the case anymore. Here at the University of Washington, we are involved with a large registry of 26,000 patients with type 1 diabetes, ranging in age from one year old all the way up to people in their 90s with type 1 diabetes. And essentially, due to all the reasons we see obesity, but also due to the fact that we do a much better job of treating type 1 diabetes now, we see obesity rates and, and overweight rates no different than the general population. So if you look at individuals, adults, 26 years of age and above, one-third of patients have obesity, one-third of patients are overweight with type 1 diabetes. That's no different than the general population. So clearly, these demographics are changing. Dr. Gill um, in the UK um, noted that risk is determined largely by the quartet of age, obesity, family history, and ethnicity, and I think this quote says it best. It's a disease that targets the rich in poor countries and the poor in rich countries. This is almost 90% of all the diabetes in the world. On the other hand, there's my daughter who's now 23 when she was 18 and a senior in high school. Um, my text to her, when I texted her that I was getting a tour of Krispy Kreme from its owner, she texted me back, tell him he is making America fat, but also tell him I want a three dozen donuts, LOL. And you know, this is, this is really a problem. Food is so easy to get, it's so plentiful, but it is really a major reason why we see the obesity. So insulin action, and this is important because people with type 2 diabetes are resistant to insulin, and we define that as a normal amount of insulin producing a subnormal biological response. Everybody with type 2 diabetes has some degree of insulin resistance. So type 2 diabetes is a condition characterized by both insulin resistance and some degree of insulin deficiency. Type 1 diabetes, it's absolute insulin deficiency. The body makes no insulin. Insulin is required for survival. In type 2 diabetes, there may be absolute insulin deficiency over time, but there's clearly not enough insulin to handle the resistance to insulin, and that is the reason why the blood sugars are high. These are also data from the UK looking at beta cell function, which is insulin secretion over time. And what you see here is that by the time somebody develops type 2 diabetes at time zero, their insulin secretion 
is only at 50% what it should be. And after six years, they've lost half of that. This is the problem. We do not know how to stop this decrease in insulin secretion, which is the reason why the majority of people, if they live long enough, and listen to what I'm saying, it's very important. The majority of people, if they live long enough to control their diabetes well, are going to need insulin therapy. And they're going to need it because we don't know how to stop this problem of reducing insulin. Now, in type 1 diabetes, it goes to zero. It never goes to zero in type 2 diabetes, which is the reason why for people with poorly controlled diabetes who need insulin, they don't end up in the hospital, they don't end up sick in an intensive care unit bed with ketoacidosis. They make enough insulin to prevent that from happening. But if they're going to control their diabetes well to prevent the complications, the majority of people over time will need insulin therapy. So that brings us to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And the good news is, even with endocrinologists, there is some consensus. We all agree that lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of therapy, no matter where in the natural history of type 2 diabetes. And I will just mention, lifestyle modification is actually a cornerstone of all types of diabetes, not just type 2 diabetes. Many can avoid other medication if there is sufficient insulin secretion after diagnosis. And when a patient is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the doctor tells the patient he or she has diabetes and just prescribes a pill without a discussion of lifestyle modification, without meeting with a nutritionist, nutritionist without learning how food impacts the blood sugar, that's not enough. You need to find somebody else who will really review the, the lifestyle modifications issues. Having said that, when medications are required, we are all in consensus that metformin is the first choice. It is cheap, it is effective, it is generally quite safe, and there's some data to suggest it actually may prevent the cardiovascular outcomes or reduce the risk of some of the cardiovascular outcomes in type 2 diabetes. The problem is where there is no consensus, and that is what medication should be used after metformin. And this is where we are all somewhat in disagreement. And the reason we're in disagreement is when we look at what's happened over the last 10 or 15 years to the number of medications we now have to treat type 2 diabetes. And if I was not a diabetes specialist, I'm not sure I could keep track of all of this, to be honest, because a new medication is coming out every year, twice a year, three times a year, and it's a lot of medications. And we don't have consensus on what medication should be used. That's the bad news. So here's the good news. Our tax dollars, our government, is funding a study called GRADE. And the University of Washington is one of the sites for the GRADE study. And what is happening in GRADE is that everybody who is on metformin, but their diabetes is not controlled, are then randomized by a computer to use a medication called glimipiride, which is a sulfonylurea, background insulin with insulin glargine, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, a medicine called liraglutide, or a DPP-4 inhibitor, a medicine called citagliptin. So these patients are randomized to one of these medicines to see over time which one works best and which one works best for the longest period of time. This is a long-term study. It started in May in 2013. And to be eligible, you need to have had your diabetes for under 10 years, only have metformin, and have a hemoglobin A1C at or above 6.8%. I have some brochures in the back if you are interested. Um, at the uh, end of the evening. But there is another study called the RISE study. Remember I said what the real problem is, is preventing that insulin secretion from coming down? Well, this is another study funded by our tax dollars, looking at patients between the ages of 20 and 65 who have BMIs above 25 but below 50, who have prediabetes, and they are either going to receive metformin insulin glargine, which is the background insulin, or liraglutide with metformin, and there will also be a, a placebo group. But the point is, we're trying to figure out what can we do not only to prevent the diabetes, that pre but to prevent this fall in insulin secretion that happens with all people. And these are all medications that are approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. There are also brochures on the RISE study in the back of the room.
And for those of you who are interested or have friends or family members who may be interested, please grab a brochure and these are the phone numbers you can call and the websites you can look at if this is something that may be interested to you, a friend or a family member. But what about the long-term complications? Um, I've had medical students over the year who get very upset with me and my colleagues because it seems like all they learn about are the complications of diabetes and we don't talk enough about the fact that all of these complications are preventable, which is true. Nevertheless, this is what diabetic retinopathy looks like. On the left, you can see the bleeding, you can see the hemorrhages, and this is what looks, it looks like after the ophthalmologist lasers the uh, retina to prevent the bleeding. And diabetic retinopathy is still the leading cause of adult blindness in the United States. And again, the real problem here is that this is preventable, and what I get so sad about are how many patients are diagnosed with their diabetes and they already have retinopathy, meaning they've probably had their diabetes for about a decade, and they didn't know it. That is very common. Diabetic kidney disease. It's the leading cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States. 44% of everybody who went on dialysis or needed a transplant, it was from diabetes. You can see the difference under a microscope between a normal kidney and the nodules that you see in the kidney in somebody with diabetic kidney disease. And then long-term complications, the nerve disease that can lead to lower extremity amputations, the nerve and vascular disease is responsible for 60% of the amputations in the United States. And depending on the country, it's even higher in some countries. This is all preventable. Cardiovascular disease, this is actually the biggest problem. Death rates in the United States are 1.7 fold higher than in the general population. The risk of fatal heart attack or stroke is higher due to many factors. The high lipid levels, cholesterol, triglycerides, high blood pressure, abnormal blood clotting, protein in the urine from early diabetic kidney disease increases the risk of a heart attack and stroke. And interestingly enough, treating the glucose down to normal levels is at best a minor minor risk factor for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. These other factors appear to be more important. So it brings up the point, can the natural history of diabetes complications be altered? The answer is yes, but what may be surprising to you is we did not know this for a fact until 1993. I remember when I was a medical student at the University of Missouri, this was a huge debate nobody knew the answer from. And this was really the major study that showed the difference. The fact that if we look at hemoglobin A1C, and the University of Washington was involved in this study, this happened to be a study of patients with type 1 diabetes. A few years later, there was another study in patients with type 2 diabetes. But what you can see is that the higher the hemoglobin A1C over time, the greater the risk of eye disease, kidney disease, nerve disease, and microalbuminuria, which is early kidney disease. And what you see is that these curves are steepest at these highest levels of hemoglobin A1C. And as the hemoglobin A1C levels come down, the curves flatten out. But this was the graph of the reason why, when you are newly diagnosed with your diabetes, why the hemoglobin A1C target is less than 7. Newly diagnosed patients under 7. The problem is making sure that you haven't had your diabetes for 10 years first, because Here's the other real important point. The most important time to manage the diabetes is in the first 10 to 15 years. After that, I don't want to say it's not important, but it's not as important as those first 10 to 15 years. We call this metabolic memory. The body remembers what happens those first 10 to 15 years after diagnosis. And I don't see those patients. Those are the patients who are seen in the primary care community by the family physicians and the internists. But that is the reason why the primary care physicians really push that hemoglobin A1C down, because the benefits will last for decades. So this is what we understand now in 2015. Tight control to prevent the complications of diabetes needs to occur early, within the first few years after diagnosis. And after several decades of diabetes, the role of glucose control does not appear to be as important, while blood pressure and cholesterol control become very critical. Too many people with type 2 diabetes are diagnosed after the complications have already started, meaning 
tight control in that population will have a last impact. And finally, with proper screening and diagnosis, most of these complications are diabe of diabetes are preventable. Most importantly, the most common rate limiting factors, at least in the United States, are adherence, often related to mental health and socioeconomic challenges, and hypoglycemia. People who have had diabetes for decades lose their awareness from hypoglycemia, and this becomes a major problem and is an area of my research here at UW. So I'm going to end on this very famous quote from 1953. You tell me if this is true today. The vast majority of diabetes in the U.S. is not controlled in any real sense. The ignorance and carelessness of patients can often rightly be blamed. Nevertheless, the majority are largely influenced by the attitude and personality of the physician. Inadequately trained physicians are apt to treat diabetes in the easiest way, which why, is why I was delighted to have the privilege of talking to these many medical physicians tonight. Thank you very much.